not knowing who God created me to be was, it was never going to end well Mm -hmm. because I was completely lost. What is my purpose in life just to look beautiful? And what am I going to get out of that? What if I stop being beautiful? What if I get a car accident and my face is mutilated? Mm -hmm. Like, am I going to lose my husband? So it was just all a trap. And so what ended up happening was years and years I've been in ministry, you know, God has completely changed my heart and he's given me hope. And Hey friend, Heather Creekmore here. Welcome to the Compared to Who show. We are continuing a two-part interview with my friend, Amanda Cunningham, who was a runway model and has an awesome story of coming to know Jesus and God touching her marriage and really transforming her life as she exited the modeling industry. I hope you enjoyed part one and I think you're really gonna enjoy today's show. So without further ado, let's go. Welcome to Compare to Who, the podcast to help you make peace with your body so you can savor God's rest and feel his love. If you're tired of fighting body image the world's way, Compare to Who is the show for you. You've likely heard lots of talk about loving your body, but my goal is different. Striving to fall in love with stretch marks and cellulite is a little silly to me. Instead, I want to encourage you and remind you with the truth of scripture that you are seen, you are known, and you are loved no matter what your size or shape. Here, the pressure is off. If you're looking for real talk, biblical encouragement, and regular reminders that God loves you and you're not alone, you've come to the right place. I hope you enjoy today's show and hey, tell a friend about it. So at the end of our marriage and things dissolved, that's another whole story. Again, not following Christ, not following his design for anything in my life things dissolved. And so here I was in this apartment with all these dreams dashed. I'm in debt. I have no husband. I have no job. And there's not exactly, um, a transferable, like, what am I going to walk into even Chick-fil-A, right? People make a lot of money. When they start Chick-fil-A, I'm going to walk in and be like, Hey, I wear this sweater really well. That's my resume. (laughs) What? (laughs) That doesn't work. Like I need to know how you work. So, well, I can walk in a dress for a you know, hundred feet with the music <laughs> pumping. Like it's just, it doesn't work. So I was terrified of where to go next. And I ended up getting really depressed and to a point where I wasn't eating. Like mm-hmm. I couldn't, it was, it made me nauseous to put food mm-hmm. to my mouth, which is mm-hmm. another whole dangerous thing. Mm-hmm. Didn't ever get any um, therapy or anything for that, but imagine this, I lost a bunch of weight and went back to work. Mm. And everyone was so happy that I was back at work. Mm. Celebrating your trauma. Yeah. And I just thought, oh God, okay, well, I have to continue not eating so I can maintain this. And Mm -hmm. and one of the clients, it was my bread and butter. It was a runway client where it was prom and bridal. And we traveled to different cities every spring and fall. So, and it was, you know, a week long. So it was consistent money. And near the end of my marriage, I had grown too large for the dresses, but Mm -hmm. they didn't know. So in between cities, I had gained weight. Mm -hmm. And I showed up and so you always have dressers helping you dress in a runway show because you have to change so fast. So they're ready to zip up pants or put on a jacket or undress you. And that's the other thing, backstage and runway, there's no privacy. Mm-hmm. There's, there's men, women, strangers, all seeing all of the things. Mm-hmm. And so I was at this client. I had just come back, you know, from a little break. We're out doing shows for Prama Bridal and my dresser's fingers were bleeding trying to get these dresses zipped and I'm like buying band-aids for her and apologize is completely mortifying. Mm -hmm. So to come back from that, she was like, Oh, my finger's better. You know? And I'm like, I'm sorry. (laughs) Like it's just terrifying. And so I was just so full of shame, but I was glad to be working again. And then I ended up meeting my now husband and we have our whole marriage testimony there. But, um, the problem was I had built up all of these lies and was trying to live my life according to them. And they never, I never had anyone say, that's not true. Mm. You don't have to do that. Mm. There are other jobs you can start over. You know, I just, I was just so trapped and I didn't realize it. Mm. But what was refreshing was when I met my husband, he is a fireman and a paramedic. And I just was so relieved when we met that he could be around the, you know, 
the most heartbreaking situations, the most real life crises and be fine. I thought, okay, he can handle me then. (laughs) (laughs) So, and I just, I just needed something real. And that's Mm -hmm. what I tell my girls. So I have a, Phil and I have two girls together now. They are 11 and 13. And I try not to share about their struggles, but of course they have them. And I am so grateful God has taught me everything because I can just lean in in those moments. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I tell them and what I'm trying to instill them, one of the main things is the the things you see on the runway or in the photos are not real, mm-hmm. period. Yeah, They're not real. If you were on a date like, I, you know, how movies, there's like a romantic movie and they go to the beach and she's in the most beautiful bathing suit and mm-hmm. her makeup and hair is fine. She goes running into the water and they're laughing and splashing. We don't really do that in real mm-hmm. life. No, <laughs> that would look ridiculous. If every time we entered the ocean with someone we love, we're like, oh. <laughs> but in a movie, it's like, oh, that's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. I want that kind of love, but that's not how real yeah. love is. So right. I just keep trying to instill to them. And I hope that it sets everyone free to remember y'all it's not real. Right. It's there's professional lighting, professional makeup and professional stylists. It, it's just a whole other mm-hmm. world. Well, and I read somewhere, I don't know whose book it was. It may have been Jennifer Strickland's. We talked about her before and she's mm-hmm. hopefully going to be part of this series too, but is it boring? I didn't think it was boring. You didn't I think mean, it was boring? I love to travel. Mm-hmm. I love to be around different people all the time. Uh For me, what I got out of it was I got to meet different people all the time and be in different places. And I never felt like I'm stuck in a cubicle Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I, I don't know where I'm headed and they could fire me at any moment with modeling. I thought, okay, well, if Dallas doesn't go well, I can move to Miami, Mm -hmm. move to LA. Mm -hmm. I can go to New York or Chicago. There's different markets. And Mm -hmm. so there was always an escape route. I just didn't realize I was trapped. Yeah. (laughs) But I think the boring comment was that you had to stand around a lot, like waiting for the weather yeah. to be right or, you know, that kind true. of thing. But that's true. I did more runway than print. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't very, um, I don't know. I just, when I show up and I've got my own stuff going on in my life and they're like, be this, I'm like, I don't want to. Um, so over time <laughs> I had to learn how to act better, uh, become a better actress, but yeah, there is a lot of hurry up and wait a mm-hmm. lot, a lot of time backstage, mm-hmm. but for me, it was cool. Cause I could read or listen to music or talk. I didn't read as much then as yeah. I do now, but, um, you know, read people magazine or something. Uh-huh. So, so tell me about when you found Jesus. Okay. So when I met Phil, I was very depressed coming off of a failed marriage. I, I met him within weeks of the separation. Okay. He had been divorced twice. And so that was another comfort. Like, okay, he's been there. He understands. Mm -hmm. And we started dating and we were in a very destructive part of our lives. You know, when you lose hope and love, Mm -hmm. (laughs) even if you're dating someone and trying to get that um, companionship and comfort and excitement, ultimately he and I had given up on love and lasting love. We were just hanging out and having fun. And as the time went on, that we grew deeper and deeper in love, but we were still terrified. Mm -hmm. So we end up uh, two and a half years after dating, he proposes and it was kind of like, okay, we're, we're going to do this. And we had a cruise plan. We were just going to go on vacation with our friends. And I remember telling my mom after he proposed, she was like, well, what are y'all going to do? I said, we're not going to do a big wedding. This is my second and his third. Obviously we're not going to do that again. Um, She's like, why don't you just get married before that that trip you have planned, like on the beach for the cruise. And I was like, done. Well, that was in like three weeks. Okay. <laughs> so we planned it really fast. And I remember sitting down with Bill. I'm like, all right, we're just going to do this super casual. We'll have a little brunch at the hotel after we get married on the beach and then we'll get on the ship. Um, so call your parents and invite them. He's like, no, I was like, what do you mean? No, he's not. Well, I don't, I mean, come on, Amanda, they've been to so many of my weddings. I'm not going to make that. And I said, Phil, you call your parents, <laughs> you let them make that decision. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but just, you know, the shame that we, mm-hmm. that we carried from the failed marriages and he, his family is very close, very large family. And he was the first to get married and like all of the branches of the family tree. Uh-huh. So we ended up getting married. And so it was just like learning to believe that there's hope. And, mm-hmm. um, I didn't know redemption yet, but just that we could actually have the family that we both dreamed about. And as soon as we got married, because we've been married before, neither one of us thought 
that we could have children, like Mm -hmm. just from our own experiences with our own (laughs) relationships and marriage, we just equally thought, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I don't think I work. And he was like, well, if we don't have kids. I was like, yeah, we'll be great. We'll be fine. Why? Well, I, I thought I was dying a month later <laughs> and it turns out I was pregnant. And so, you know, we hadn't been married long and, um, I was pregnant with my oldest Charlotte. So we get through the pregnancy and I'm just learning so much, you know, I'm just going to all the classes. I'm like, okay, we're going to do this. And, and I had seen models come back. They had mm-hmm. had babies and they had bounced back and gotten back to work. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to be one of those girls. I am not going to be one that disappears because I have no idea what I'll do Mm -hmm. if I don't model. And so I'm gaining weight, I'm gaining weight. And I remember there was a a runway show for Saks in New Orleans. And my first trimester, no one knew I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't know when you fly, you swell up a little bit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I got, you know, into the fitting for the show and they're all standing there looking at our bodies and they came over to me. They're like, girl, are you pregnant? I was like, I am. I'm sorry. They're like, it's okay. We have a trench coat for that. (laughs) So I wore like a giant sweater and a trench. It was just embarrassing. So, um, we end up, you know, getting through the pregnancy and learning what it's going to be like. We are going to have this family, but we don't know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And Charlotte came. And so we're figuring out all the baby stuff and how to be a husband and a wife and how, how I'm going to stay up and feed her all night. He's at the fire station up all night. Like, how does life look? And I just remember rocking Charlotte and looking at her little fingers and her little toes. And I thought, what is this? I was intimate with my husband and I ate McDonald's for nine months and I get a child. Mm -hmm. Like that's a miracle. And I was Mm -hmm. like, okay, I think there's something to this God. Mm -hmm. And I had um, attended Catholic church when I was younger that was just how my parents were raised. There was one in town and I went to CCD every week. And uh, when it was time to get confirmed, I just thought, why? Mm-hmm. If all I have to do is say, I'm sorry. And then this, this, this what, the slate is wiped clean. Mm-hmm. What's the point? I don't believe that. I don't, I don't believe God's that smart. If your God is so good, why is he a fool to just forgive everything? Mm-hmm. So I didn't get confirmed. Mm-hmm. And then I didn't really, I only went to church. My mom made me. <laughs> up until this point where I have Charlotte and I'm like, Oh no, I think I might be wrong. So I start asking, Hey, Phil, what do you think about going to church? And he's like, well, what church? I said, well, there's this Anglican church, which I heard it's like, it's like Protestant theology, which is what he was raised, but it's Catholic and liturgy. So we could have like both. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want to get the girls baptized. And he, you know, just his tradition was like, I think it should be their choice, but if you want to sprinkle water in their forehead, fine. <laughs> so we, we get Charlotte baptized. And then uh, soon after that, I get pregnant with Claudia and I have Claudia, we get her baptized, but he's not into church at all. Mm. And then we end up moving across town closer to his work and we build a house. And so we're in this new town. I have a one and a three-year-old and I'm feeling like I'm starting to feel like I need to get these questions answered about who God is. And we get invited to church in our new town. It's a mega church. Mm-hmm. It's huge. Is it the church and you I, go to now? Yeah. Yeah. I, I've been there too. I used to go there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, as a, an unbeliever, I thought, oh no, I'm not going to some televangelist asking for money. I'm mm-hmm. not going. And Phil was like, well, I mean, some of the firemen go there and they're inviting us. And I was like, nope. And then I, I sat on that. I thought if my husband wants to go to church, <laughs> I should try it. Mm-hmm. I should just go. As soon as we get in the door, um, it was so awesome for us. We didn't have a lot of help when we were young parents. And I mean, we were like, this is free babysitting. (laughs) (laughs) It's terrible. I'm just going to say it. He (laughs) likes to drink coffee. We just like sit there and listen to the music and not be bothered to be, you know, these ill-equipped parents for two hours and, or one hour, you know, if we went to small group anyways. So, um, as, and after we were like, okay, well, maybe we should start going a little more. And Phil was like, you know what I think? I think that our girls should hear the stories and decide for themselves. Mm-hmm. And he always tells people, you know, how ignorant of me to think that they wouldn't notice their dad's own indifference, mm-hmm. <laughs> but that they would. So that's why we went was for them. And so that we get free babysitting <laughs> not too long into it. They start a series called fixing your marriage. Mm-hmm. They were launching a marriage ministry. And so they're leading into it. And I was like, it's hitting home Mm -hmm. every 
sentence every Mm. weekend. And I thought, well, we're going to this marriage ministry. And he was like, no, we're not, you know? So it's just this tug and pull of like what we were willing to do. So I ended up going by myself for, I think maybe six weeks and we, and then he ended up coming, which later on, I'm thinking, I believe in the power of prayer. Like what made him come? No one was praying for us, but he ended up coming. We get involved in this marriage ministry and a four weeks in to small group, they have a lesson on forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And each week you focus on something first, it was love and then understanding. So we get to forgiveness and you have homework each week where you'd fill it out by yourself. And then you get together before you meet up with the whole group again and go over each other's homework, which was very hard to do when you mm-hmm. put all these walls up and, um, it was very vulnerable, even with people who are married, sharing their lives together and our parents. So we sit down and we had had such a destructive relationship. There's alcohol, uh, in major excess. We're both broken and just not, um, not doing the things we should have when we were dating, Mm -hmm. didn't know the Lord. So there was a lot of baggage. There was a lot of pain, a lot of wounds. And I could not wait to hear him say, finally, he was sorry. Because every time we argue, he would avoid it, he'd skirt it. And so I just kept this list going, like someone someday is going to listen to me. So here's a forgiveness lesson mm. and he's going to have to say, sorry. So we go down, sit down and do our homework. And I said, why don't you go first? Because he's going to have to ask for forgiveness. I know that I've already done my homework. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, well, I'll go first. And everything I had said, this hurts me. Why did you do this? You know, he lists it all out and he asks for forgiveness. And I was just like, oh, thank God. I'm so glad you finally said it. Yes, I forgive you. Okay, well now I'll go with my list because this will be easy. And I start saying, you know, please forgive me for being self-destructive, for being selfish, um, for taking advantage of you. I just go down this list and I just start bawling. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, this isn't about what he needed to ask. This is me. I needed mm-hmm. to whoa, Lord, look at this list. Like I am doing a terrible job of running my life on my own. I said, okay, I give it to you, God. Mm. And he, in that moment was like, I think I believe again. It was just this crazy (laughs) coming together. And beyond that, you know, I hadn't been really raised in the church uh, or really conformed to it. So they were like, well, you need to get baptized. So I went and got baptized and I come out of the baptistry and everyone's, you know, crowds around me because they saw me on the big screen. Like, why didn't you tell us you're getting baptized? I'm like, are you supposed to do that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And so then I'm telling people, oh, I got, you know, I gave up, I, I, uh, I said, God, Hey, you take it. And I got baptized and people like, oh, you gave your life to Christ. And I'm like, <laughs> what does that mean? Like, <laughs> it yeah. was just very bizarre, but, um, and then we, you know, we just started like, okay, everything we could do as God gave it to us, like, how can we turn from it mm-hmm. and do it? How God says, and it's yeah. been crazy crazy rides since then. Oh, that's so awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love that story. Thank you for listening to this episode that is part of the Spark Media Network that can now be heard on the Edify app. Hey there, have you read The Burden of Better yet? The Burden of Better is my book on how to lead a comparison-free life. Yes, that's right. I actually believe it's possible to live a life without comparing yourself to others all of the time. If that sounds good to you, I hope you'll snag a copy of The Burden of Better. You can get it wherever Christian books are sold, or you can start reading the first two chapters free right now on my website. Go to compare to who.me, look for the books tab and find Burden of Better, and you can click right there and start reading today. I hope you enjoy it. Grab your copy of Burden of Better and then join us for our book club at the end of every month this spring, we're talking about the book together. And I would love to hear your questions or your thoughts. You can drop me an email at heather at compared to who.me, or you can go to compared to who.me slash podcast, scroll to the bottom and leave me a voicemail message on SpeakPipe. I can't wait to hear what you think after you read The Burden of Better. What would you say to someone who's thinking about going in the modeling industry? Like, mm-hmm. But how would you, what if one of your daughters comes to you and she's like, I think I want to be a model. <laughs> they have. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, yeah. so, so what do you say? I mean, no, 
<laughs> no, just say no. <laughs> and, and, and then I said, you know, there's lots of reasons. Mm-hmm. Basically you can be beautiful no matter what your job is. If your goal mm-hmm. is to feel beautiful and confident and healthy and fashionable and successful, mm-hmm. you can do that in any industry. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be a model to mm-hmm. be that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately this is what I believe is that we're so young mm-hmm. when, when you get put in modeling, they prefer you to be in your teens. Mm-hmm. We don't know who we are. Mm-hmm. And so you're absorbing what everyone needs from you each shoot. Like, well, today we need you to look like this today. We need you to act like this. And so if you're, if you know who you are and you have a strong foundation and God has very clearly, you know, spoken to you about what your mission is and what your identity is, you know, your identity is firmly rooted in Christ. I think you're more likely able to be in that industry and resist the temptation to um, not respect your body and to not be um, respectful of God's creation and to be greedy or to fall into drugs. Like there's so many mm-hmm. temptations that are just amped up in that world yeah. that most young people are not equipped and there's not going to be a strong influence in, I'm, I'm just going to say it, fashion and entertainment industry is, is not majority Christian. Mm-hmm. So if you're wanting to live a Christian life and be on a mission for God, you're not going to get spurred on by mm-hmm. the vast majority of people in the industry. Yeah. So, whereas we don't want to be separate from the world and never engage with the world, we can't be of the world mm. if we're living in our identity. So yeah. that's my argument to them. And they're always like, what? Yeah. I just want to be cool, mom. <laughs> and <laughs> that fades. I mean, yeah. if we're basing our lives on how beautiful we can look at 19, 20, 25, and then trying to maintain that forever, we're missing everything else God's trying to do mm-hmm. in our lives. Absolutely. So what about the long-term impact? You know, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> you said I can ask you no, it's whatever. True. It's true. Absolutely. I'm just, it's not pretty. So, <laughs> so like, you know, so what, what do you think that time did to your body image and maybe your relationship with food to, mm. you know, that's always tied in Definitely. there. Like what, you know, what kind of stuff do you feel like is the aftermath of all that? For me, because my body was going to change into uh, a fuller figure Mm -hmm. and, and right now I'm going through a healing process with food. So I weigh heavier than probably what my ideal weight would be, but that's part of my process. Mm -hmm. Um, mine too, mine too. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I accept that. I know that God's given me grace and guidance to move through that eventually. (laughs) But Mm -hmm. so the problem with it is that we are just set up for failure. Mm-hmm. You're set up for failure. If, if the goal is to stay this beautiful image that people will stay around you, they're staying for the wrong reasons and you're not going to be able to keep it up. Mm-hmm. Even if you get Botox for the rest of your life and you can mm-hmm. afford that and mm-hmm. still, you know, contribute to the church and the mission. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are we going to afford Botox on our entire bodies? <laughs> like, even if our face looks great, like mm-hmm. other things are moving and sagging. So <laughs> And how does that glorify God if we're trying to preserve the physical body that does not matter? I mean, if we look yeah. at Jesus's life, there's not a clear description in the Bible of what he looked like. Yeah. Other than and he wasn't anything. Other than he, he wasn't, wasn't good looking. Yeah. yeah. And so other than Esther, who I be- believe is maybe the only woman in the Bible who God made her look a certain way to put her in a certain place for a certain time and mission. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm that's not prescriptive. That was just descriptive of her calling. So I just want to encourage other women to leverage what God has given you. Maybe he's given you a certain skin color, ethnicity, ethnicity that you can go into places of the world and evangelize that others can't. Mm -hmm. And like, that's the stuff we should be looking at. That's how God made it so beautiful and uniquely. Hey friends, I am so excited that it's April and I am smack dab in the middle of coaching a fabulous group of women. Coaching is one of my favorite things because I count no greater joy or privilege than to walk alongside another woman and to help her go from a place where she is in body image bondage and can't see her true beauty to a place where she can see herself as God sees her and see herself as more than just a body. If you're looking for a sister, a guide, 
someone who can help you approach body image issues in a truth-filled, gospel-filled way, I hope you'll look into coaching with me. Go to comparedtohu.me slash coaching or comparedtohu.me, the coaching tab to find out more. Living a life where what is most important is what you weigh and what you look like. I mean, some people choose to live that life, even though they're not modeling, like you mentioned earlier. Right. But, but what's the long-term effect of actually having someone asking you about that? It's just, uh, for me, it's just been super painful because, um, family or friends that value you in a certain way, like you can't maintain that our bodies are made to change and age and grow. And that is a gift. I mean, what's the alternative right. that we <laughs> die young? Nobody, right. nobody would think that would, that's what God has planned for us is for all to die young. Like, of course we want to age and, you know, gray hair is a crown of glory and, mm-hmm. and crown of wisdom. Is that what it says? Yeah. Um, so what ended up happening for me is I got the family I always wanted. Mm-hmm. I got the marriage that I had been fighting for. And then I couldn't be joyful in it because Mm -hmm. if we're going to the swimming pool or we're going on a date night, my thoughts are constantly wrapped around like, what do I look like? Is my bathing suit nice enough? Is my skin smooth enough? Am I small enough? Uh, Are my body parts high enough? Uh, Is my hair shiny enough? Do I have the cute, like, is my husband, is his eye or his eyes going to wander at dinner um, to, you know, it's like, am I, am I capturing his attention enough? It was just relentless. And then I rebelled so far against it that I was hurting myself. You know, I'm, I'm lethargic and I don't want to take care of myself and I'm eating trash 99% of the time. So not knowing who God created me to be was, it was never going to end well Mm -hmm. because I was completely lost. What is my purpose in life just to look beautiful and what am I going to get out of that? What if I stop being beautiful? What if I get a car accident and my face is mutilated? Mm -hmm. Like, am I going to lose my husband? So it was just all a trap. And so what ended up happening was years and years I've been in ministry, you know, God has completely changed my heart and he's given me hope and he's redeemed all these broken things about me. One of my friends went to start a ministry for young girls, um, healing from eating disorders. So we all go to support her and pray her up. And at the end, she's like, if you know anyone who could speak truth into these women, that anything that's related, we'd love to have you come. And I thought, you know, I've never talked about modeling. Mm -hmm. It's just this thing I cut off. I ended it. Oh, I didn't even talk about that. But yeah, when I became a mom, I never went back to modeling. Okay. Completely quit. I just wasn't willing to do what it would take for me to be that size again. And it was so, so hard for me to imagine going from like explosive diapers to bright lights. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't (laughs) reconcile the shift in my day. Um, so I ended up staying home and I've been home ever since. Um, but so I never went back to modeling and I just cut it off. I never talked about it. I didn't hang out with those people anymore. If anyone knew I was a model, I didn't want them to talk about it. And so there was this opportunity. I was like, you know, I could share just kind of the downfalls and like the real truth. Like I'm not going to come in here and sugarcoat anything about the industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Flying around is fun, but you can travel for all different kinds of work as well. <laughs> um, but okay. So I just volunteer and I say, Hey, I have this insider knowledge and I could just help kind of break down whatever idolatry, every, whatever like image they think is so cool and, and help them see like the true path that God has for them. I promise you, it's not going to be focusing on your appearance and for your career anyway. So I volunteered to do it and I write this teaching and I go to offer it. And it was awesome. Like the women that showed up that night were very encouraged, but I realized in that evening, I had so much healing to do Mm -hmm. so much healing. So where I thought like, Oh, I've already learned everything. God's already redeemed this. I can just start Mm -hmm. teaching this. It hit me right away that oh man, you have so much to work on. And so after that, you know, I I got into several different areas of counseling, um, working on just things from my childhood I picked up and really working on my relationship with food and really appreciating my body. And I read the Bible front to back, like, what am I supposed to be doing with my body? What am I supposed to be eating? What am I, you know, what are we supposed to be longing for in our appearances? And I just keep coming back to the Pharisees that, all they cared about was their appearance right. and power and superiority. And Jesus came and was completely counter to that. 
And so it just breaks my heart when I see women of Christ pursuing what we know the Pharisees were um, corrected for. Right. Right. Oh, Amanda, that's so good. Well, I could probably talk to you for another hour. I really appreciate you being willing to just share your story and yeah. share like the, the, I don't know, true side or what the dark side. <laughs> I don't know what yeah. <laughs> it's the true side. Yeah. 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 No, I really appreciate that. This has been super helpful. So what are you, what are you doing today? Like today you're still encouraging women. Like how can, oh, how yeah. can someone connect with you? Instagram, what's your website? Like all those things. Nice. All right, let's do it. So now it's been about three years since God has started working on this message that I am modeled by, by him, our maker. And, you know, I used to pride myself on being a self-made woman. And that's why I kept pursuing this path and whatever it took to just stay modeling when God had other plans for me. And I just wasn't willing to hear who he was or what he wanted. So he's just been teaching me how being modeled by the maker and submitting ourselves to him and his plan is our most beautiful self. And what Christ did for us on the cross is what gives us our worth and our beauty. And so I'm so grateful now I get opportunities like this to share everything he's taught me in the quiet places of my, my broken heart, um, just to use all the pain I've been through to free other women so that we do not get hung up on this and we can do the good works he's given us. But my website is Amanda from Texas.com. Texas is spelled out. And then all my social media is Amanda from Texas, but it's A M A N D A F R O M T X. Yeah. So it's abbreviated. Um, awesome. But yeah, you can find me there. And I'd love to connect with anyone who just needs encouragement in this area. Awesome. Thanks. And I'll put all those links in the show notes so everyone thank can you. find you. Well, Amanda, thanks so much for being on the show today. Oh, thank you so much for letting me come. I have loved getting to know you and can't wait to hear the next episode and the series. <laughs> And thank you for watching or listening today. I hope something in today's episode has helped you stop comparing and start a living. Bye-bye. If something from today's show blessed you, may I ask a huge favor? Leave a review on your favorite platform. Seeing your five-star reviews is a huge encouragement to me. Not sure how to do it? You can go to compare to who.me slash podcast, scroll to the bottom, and you'll find all the information. And while you're at compare to who.me, check out some of the more than 500 articles on there about body image, comparison, all the things you're thinking about. Plus, you can find out more about my books, or you can grab a time for a free 10 minute call to see if coaching is right for you. I'm so honored to be a part of your journey out of body image and comparison frustration. And I can't wait to hear how God is working to set you free.